Good evening, friends. I'm a little more comfortable outside the lectern, so, so I can just point to the screen and stuff. Uh, I am a civil engineer. I passed out from uh, College of Engineering, Kamaldi. And I've been practicing designing structures and building houses and bungalows buildings. Uh, I have always had a love for the arts, as our host has said. Uh, in terms of architecture, writing, painting, I love watching, reading, and discussing. And that's how uh, six years back we founded uh, the Goa Writers Group, of which we have our founder members here. Uh, if I was involved in Kokuni writing and uh, Kokuni arts, largely through the inspiration of uh, Dagobert Mauzo. So, I do a bit of fiction writing, short fiction again, short stories. I uh, originally intended to speak about the blog, the blog on Go on architecture that I uh, maintain. Well, it's been running the last two, three years and it's not updated much. But we'll talk about it later uh, in the process uh, as we go along. What I would like to speak about today is the process, the act of creation. I, mean, I write short stories. Bhai also writes short, short stories. We all write essays, plays, poetry. But I'm always intrigued about how we develop that the genesis, the seed of the idea, expand on it, how things add on to each other. I'm a doctor and engineer, so I want the process, the mechanism. And I'm always intrigued. I read a lot of essays and, and uh, philosophy and literature regarding this. So let's look at the act of creation. I write in two languages, Konkani and English. Largely in English, I, I wrote largely in English until I discovered that there was something missing, something not really emerging from what I was inside. I had read a lot of English literature as a child, our parents had given a lot of books and they have read and read all the classics and a lot of modern literature as well. But it was only after initiation into Konkani literature that I began to relate with who are people around us much more. The French philosopher Roland Barthes, he talks about uh, you know, structuralism and all this uh, new pangal, the concepts of philosophy. So he says every language is a world. Now in Kokani, I will not be talking about uh, differential equations or some you know biomolecular structure of so and so, so enzyme and all that. If you read Kokani literature, it's about the fields, about nature, about uh, the harvest, about the relationships between man and woman, about love, about children. It's about a certain way of life that Goa and the Kokani people knew. English is a much vaster language, French, German. Each of them is a world. So every time you destroy a language or you let it die, a world dies along with it. And that same approach says, we don't speak languages. A language is a construct. Sometimes in the, in the German language you may have one word meaning four or five different things and each time you have got to use that word for two different things. In English we have every language we have that issue. So in a very subtle way the languages speak us. We don't only speak the language, the language speaks us. It, it defines our approach and what, how we try to express ourselves to the world. So let's look at a few short stories. I try to let me put a disclaimer here. I am not a famous uh, writer. I am. I have no claim to fame. I have not published a single book of short stories. Uh, whatever short stories you see here are published in the local newspapers and the magazines, of which I'm quite proud of. So my interest, largely, is to present my act of uh, creation or writing as kind of lab rat, you know, guinea pig. So I always looked at myself. Oh, this is heaven. How did this happen? Where did that come from? So this is my sort of very modest presentation. I did not want to come across as a pompous uh, person in any way. Okay. So this was one of the first stories that I wrote. That's an English uh, version and the Pompey version. I write and I rewrite and I translate my own stories. Okay. There's no translator. So you may ask, which is the original story in Pompey and which is the original story in English? There's a lot of sort of deeper introspection that has to go into that. But this story was about a, a woman who was in a, in a house and this is based on a real life story. She lived uh, in Sioni, an aunt of a friend of mine. And she refused to leave that house. She was old, she wouldn't take care of herself. And she refused to leave the 
how the discuss the spread of uh, my uh, nephew. He wanted to shift her to an old age home, but she stubborn, stubbornly refused. And everybody tried. The local panchayat came, the neighbors came. They tried to take her out of the house. Adamant, she was proud of the house. I was born here, and I will die here. And she had a dog, and the dog was devoted to her. She was devoted to the dog. She would talk to the dog in Portuguese. It was amazing, and I went along with this friend of mine, and I saw, you know, this whole these repeated attempts. And then I said, I suggested to him, see, she's very close to that dog. Perhaps if you take away the dog, the, the last reason for her staying in the house will go away. So I wrote the story using the same characters, and at the end, I killed the dog. You know, uh, the the this uh, friend of mine, he gets a local. Uh, dog sugar and puts a bullet in the dog when she's sleeping and she comes and she's completely devastated and the next day they take her away. Okay. So now here almost 90% of that story took place in real life. I only had to add a little twist at the end. And uh, so that was the story and it was published in book. The next Saibin. So in Goa we have this tradition where we carry the image of our lady. I don't know if you're familiar with this, we take it from house to house in the neighborhood and you pray and then it, it, your, your family takes it to the next house where they pray and then they take it to the next house, it makes the whole round of the whole village and comes back to the church. Now this was, the intention is that neighbors meet each other, they all gather together during this period. So even if there's some hostility or misunderstanding is resolved, the intent is interpersonal relationship to be better between the household. Anyway, so there was this cyber uh, uh, going on in a relative uh, uh, place, and I went there, and I was standing here, and there were these, you know, very dirty laborers who had come there and uh, standing next to me, and I felt a little irritated because the stinking guys, and, you know, all all, all all our people are very decent and upright, and these guys are going to go inside the house, and they don't even know the family and all that kind of, you know, I and this uh, relative were quite outraged. I mean, here we are praying to God, you know, about all things, and we are feeling this hostility towards another group of people here, who we are afraid to go and pollute our house inside. And the hypocrisy of it struck me very much, and I wrote a short story about it. This house had a little bar on, attached to it. You know, there are some, some, some houses, one of the rooms is converted into a tavern or a bar, and, uh, you know, liquor is sold there, and people are served, or whatever, beer, whiskey, penny. I hope some of you have paid a list of penny, it's Goa's national drink, and Cecil is an expert on it. <laughs> so, now, he is full of fury, and he's about to drive them away, and he manages to drive half of them away, and then the siphon gets over, and those fellows, he finds, have gone into the, the bar. And usually he rushes inside and tells his wife, there are some customers at the bar, go and treat them and give them whatever they want. He doesn't want to lose that business. <coughs> so the hypocrisy of it, you know, we are praying, we are all prayers are about God and love and all that, and welcoming people to our house, and we hate these people, but the minute they are commercial, financial interest to us, we want them there. So that was the story Saibin. The red marks, yeah, the red marks that you see in these are uh, by Mozos. He is the one who has always been correcting and checking and uh, helping, helping me out in my stories. Uh, so this is Saibin. And then we have, again, as I say, Saibin almost 90% reality, 10% of a twist. Higher ground. This is a short story where I was standing one day up by the side of a uh, pavement at Margaon. And this, you know, we have the markets, we have the new market, the old market, everything is very orderly organized. And there was this woman sitting with her mangoes by the footpath which is actually, going by municipal rules, illegal. You cannot sell your fruits or fish everywhere, anywhere you want. But she found it convenient to sell them the competition was too much in the market, so she was selling there. And she was always alert, you know, she was looking this way, that way. And the minute she heard some sound that, hey, 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 they're coming, they're coming. The municipal inspectors would come on their rounds. She would just take a basket and run away. I still have in Margao. The bishop folk, you know, they get a tip off, something come from that side. And these municipal inspectors, they come like rampaging bulls. They just come and kick the bundle and spin the basket. And they grab whatever fish and they drive everybody in. It's chaos. They are authorized. They can do it. They can seize anything. So, she ran. <coughs> then I, I thought of the 
past, how probably in the past when there were settlers like this and other settlers dominated them, they too must have been trying to get order and the earlier ones must have been wanting a more chaotic organic lifestyle. So I wrote a story about the you know, kind of two parallel uh, timelines. So then this story was half reality seen and half imagined. I'm just I'm trying to draw a comparative uh, relationship between the uh, seven stories I want to uh, show you this. So this is a uh, high ground it was written uh, publishes now, which means Ram. Next, a Bapu Kale's house. This was a house, again, I read a newspaper clipping in the Herald about a siren being sounded in a village. It was a mock drill, an evacuation siren. And everybody was evacuated and taken into buses or everything and transported around. But some villagers didn't know that this evacuation was going to take place and they resisted. They said, no, you're kidnapping our children and all kind of a... There was a major ruckus and chaos there. Because they thought that, what is this style? And why are you coming? You come to uh, sort of take away something of ours. And I know a story where this old man, you know, 80, 90 year old man and his wife, they resist these officials and the police people who try to come and take them. And he is an old freedom fighter who has been fighting the Portuguese in his youth and all that. And so he pulls out his gun, his rifle from the thing, and he starts firing at the police and, you know, the three not three rifles, shotgun, and shoots at them and all that kind of thing. And the whole night he stays guard. And they talk about the past and he and his wife. And I, mean, I know it's all spoilers for the short story, but I must tell you all the same. So in the morning, when the, he sees that the villagers are coming back, they have been evacuated and they have come back after the night. He wakes up his wife and says, we won, we won. <laughs> so that's Kapo Kali, struggle for house. Now, you'll see here, what dream are they talking about? And then suddenly I shift. I need to talk, I need to write in Konkani to express what I feel. Because obviously this old man, the 19 year old man, he is not going to talk in English. I cannot relate to him speaking English and I cannot write a story in English. So if that is a period and that is a culture, that is a video of things, I have to speak and write in Konkani. So this is how the two languages are used. I often use English as a structure in the genesis and structure of the story, but the thought, the feeling, the ethos has to come from Kokri. Which is why you see this kind of split narrative which sometimes gets quite schizophrenic at times. And that will be a, a, so give you an idea of which stories are originally in Kokri and which stories are originally in English. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the line there. Yeah, just, oh, okay. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the cop that lived at Papo Kale's house stood on the mud board to come on and decided to grow. And it goes on. The next, next slide. The pen. Now, Bapo Kale's house, again, I must say, how much was it? 90% of uh, real experience that we there? No. It was just a small newspaper clipping. The physical real time input was just one newspaper clipping, and so almost say 25%. And 75% had to be imagination. The pen. I lost my sister uh, around three years back, and I lost my mother two years back, a year after. Uh, uh, the sister, and I was in a very melancholy state of mind. One night when I was sleeping, I was listening to the old of the pen in our house, the very old creaky pen, and he was making the sound, vroom, 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 kind of very uh, kind of rumble. And I, and I thought I could hear some voices on the pen. I mean, maybe you have felt it. Some kind of whether somebody is talking in the other room or something like that. So I wrote a story based on that. Yeah, this man is in old age home, this is the pen, and his whole life begins to be told through the rumble and the sound of the pen. In between the voltage rises and it, the sound changes, the lights go off, the pen stops, and all this kind of thing. Now what is the real time input for that? Merely the sound of the pen. The rest of it comes in from your past, your experience, your childhood, your uh, teenagehood, your adulthood, what's happening around you, what you've heard, what you've read. So then we move to the next one. Nats, Nats is a science fiction story which was purely imagination. It's about a um, group of farmers who come one day to the field and uh, they find that the, I mean, the farmer finds that the wood is not ready to plow a particular area of the field. He can, the man can walk them up and down, but the wood is not ready to go the The bullocks are not ready to go there. So then they, both the villagers are called and other people come, scientists come. 
want to define it that there is some kind of extraterrestrial object there, which everybody, humans can walk through, but the animals sense. And then there is more ruckus whether villagers want to, you know, they think there's deity, there's some god is there. And they want to build a temple at that point. And the scientists say this is a most unique, uh, never before happened, a natural uh, UFO has arrived there and we have to somehow find ways to take it to the laboratory and study it. And so they bring all kinds of grains and police but they can't live because there's nothing there. So the title of that was Nats because in Kukri Nats means nothing and Nats also means dance, the dance of nothing. But purely imaginary. Okay, next. Piva. Piva was, as the Bible would say, it's a bit of a surrealistic uh, postmodern story. It's about a man whose shadow gets a fever. Yeah, his shadow gets a fever and he goes about, you know, the doctor tells him you've got to do this treatment and that, his wife tries to treat it and all that kind of thing. And then the end of the story, I did not tell you the end of the story, but that sort of reveals why the shadow had a fever. Okay, next. Ah, we are engineers, so we love to draw these graphs and all these kind of things. Like so. Comparative extents of real time versus imagination in stories. And we, all those poppers who use the internet, love that small thing which goes slow, and you loading, 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 finish. <laughs> so, Zeman uh, and Saipin were real events, where I only had to add around 5 or 10 percent of a twist. Higher ground was this instead of, I saw this woman being chased by the municipal inspector, so that much. Bapo Kale's house was, I read a clipping in the newspaper. The fan, I heard the sound of the fan. Nuts. Science fiction, imaginary, purely speculative. Fever, <clears throat> fever. Now here comes the crunch, a very much loved uh, topic of mine. The story fever came, the concept of it came in a dream. I dreamt. In my dream there was this character who shadow had a fever. And it was all so realistic that I said, ah, let me capture this exact thing in a story. I thought I would be called crazy when I wrote a story, but uh, it seemed like it was a very well light story. So dreams are a beautiful source for your creative ideas. Not only for writing, for writing, for painting, for engineering, for anything. Next. Bi associative thinking. Dreaming and bi associative thinking. I think these are the two most important uh, factors for me in terms of creation. There is this author called Arthur Kessler. Uh, I've read his book about the act of creation. Uh, next. Uh-huh, yes. Uh, okay. Washing, washing powder in the room. Okay, next. So, what was that? <laughs> what was that? Why are you laughing? You're laughing because of bi associative thinking. You did not expect that. Here we are talking about the, uh, the act of creation. For our stories are being written and all that. And suddenly there's washing powder in the room come up there. So, you had a plane, we had the plane of discussion of story genesis and suddenly you have this advertisement and cutting across that plane which is what Arthur Kessler talks about in this con uh, concept of bi-associative thinking. Wherever two planes of thought intersect, you get something new, something funny, something ridiculous or something innovative, something creative. See, when you have a tragic story, a tragic tale, your emotions rise, rise until you finally crash and you have catharsis. When you have comedy, humor, you rise, right? Suddenly something else hits you. A joke, a joke is always about two things intersecting, <coughs> clashing together. And at that point of uh, an unexpected thing, you laugh. Now, creative process, uh, uh, writing also works, and all creative process, I believe, works at intersections of this kind of multi social thinking. Next. So, you can start writing with an idea. Those of you who would love to write uh, stories, start with an idea, a new storyline, and the story writes itself, picking up fragments from your mind. You will wonder how this came, where this came, but it's all coming. It was there in your past, in, in your memories, it starts adding on as and when required. The fragments come from what you have seen, heard, read, and felt in the past. To enrich the mind story, you have to experience like travel, talk, love, hate, read, hear, smell, feel. Ideas also come in your dreams. Dreams. Lose logic linkages. Uh, it's, it's
It's very interesting. Dreams. We some. I mean, how many of you dream? <laughs> Everyone dreams. We all dream for at least two hours in the night. The point is that we don't remember some of the dreams. Ninety percent of our, ninety-five percent of our dreams are not remembered. And what is the function of dreams? If you, the best place to just go to Wikipedia and read the various theories of dreams. And there are lots. We still don't know. Dreams are a function of erasing sensory impressions, not fully worked out. So you either maintain that incomplete material, or you harden it into your memory. Purpose of dreams. Dreams are like the cleaning up operation of computers when they are offline. Defrag, everybody is familiar with defrag, those who work on a PC. You defrag your machine so that you sort out everything in its memory. The opposite is that it has an information handling memory consolidating function also common. The key of this is that in dreams, there are a lot of incomplete hanging ideas and concepts which are floating around in mind with loose logical linkages. They are not connected, so you find the most absurd and ridiculous connects. And they are the ones which you can use for good creative work. Right? Dali, you were speaking about some of the Dali. Here you are. One second before awakening from a dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate. This pomegranate down here and the bee is the starting point of the dream. And then the pomegranate ex explodes there. You've got a fish. Out of the fish comes the tiger, out of the tiger's mouth comes another tiger, but it is the bayonet which will prick the sleeping woman and wake her up, which is actually the sting of the bee. I mean, Sarvadhan Dali also was trying to demonstrate Freud's concept that external stimuli can, can create or cause dreams. Okay, next. Dream is compensated. As I said, use the dreams that you get in your mind as, uh, as a storehouse for ideas that you can use in many different ways. When they, whether they are kept or thrown out, dreams present ideas thrown because the most random way. The conscious forces of logic are shut down. Bisociative and multi-sociative connections are being made. If captured and written down, they provide an excellent ore, I call it ore, for creative work, writing, painting and engineering solutions. Excellent playground for interdisciplinary fusion. When they keep telling you in management, think laterally, think outside the box. What they're telling you is to break all your normal logical linkages, scatter them, rearrange them, and you have new solutions. Next. So how do you dream and how do you collect those ideas? How do you use them? Dream mining. Very difficult under the uh, sort of the uh, it's a skill that has to be trained. Women tend to have more frequent dream recall than men. So there's a kind of advantage there over men. At least 95% of the dreams are not remembered because the chemicals required for short term memory to long term are suppressed during dreaming. Okay, next. Dream fruit. Some of the stories that I have written have come from dreams. The basic concept comes from dreams. So don't just ignore it or just jot down those ideas and you can consolidate them into many things. So, mural. I mean, I am. We are talking about you know, engineering. I had a dream. It's not uh, Lincoln or uh, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, I had a dream where there was this bathroom, and instead of the on the tiles, there was this mural, and the mural was composed of soap. There was the sky, there were the mountains, and there was the, the sea down there. And the mountains, you know this man, this character in the dream, he, he, when he's having a bath, he touches the mountains and, and that's the lavender soap. The sky is musk and the, the river is something else. And I said, wow, why do we have to think of soap only in a soap dish? Maybe someday some manufacturer will create a mural which is on the wall and you have a bath, you just rub that and you take a bath, and you know, so why not? So this is, I'm, this is just demonstrate. And the most absurd ideas in dreams can someday be a lucrative uh, invention of sorts. Differential equations on the beach. I had this dream where <laughs> I had this dream, very strange. I told Eddie about it some days back. But this people on the beach were, you know, in acrobatic positions and they were forming integrals and differential equations. And I remember uh, something x, y squared upon a equals this and that. And I said, what the hell is this? Equations and people on the beach, 
Now this is what I mean by loose logical linkages. Are you familiar with Kekulé and the molecular structure of benzene? Because he, he was trying to figure out the structure of benzene and couldn't get C, A, O and organic uh, molecular structure. Finally, Kekulé had a dream where he saw two snakes fighting and trying to eat each other. One the snake's tail was the other snake's mouth and vice the other way around. So they were just going round and round. The next morning he woke up and he said the circular molecular structure of benzene, I mean it is circular. It's it's with that. It's, and he did it and that was a kind of breakthrough for him. He came to dream. Many other things like this. Yeah, next. Yeah. So uh, lateral thinking, biosociative uh, approaches, multidimensional, interdisciplinary vision gives a lot uh, Rise to a lot of things. There are a few of the things that I have been working on in the past. I am a student, I am a practicing engineer, but a few of these products that I have dabbled with, I can show here. This is a box of cards, we've got a sample there. And I, I found one day, uh, you know, this quiz card will come uh, about whatever. Your any is the quiz master. And so we get a box of cards about, uh, your, you know, Western or European, or which king was there. So I said, why don't we have something on Goa about this? So I researched for a couple of years, I compiled around a thousand facts and I put them in the set of these 200 uh, cards and five questions in the front, five questions behind. We sold around 2,000 copies and now they are out of print. Next. <laughs> the Paris Ships of Goa is a book which again connects my love for architecture, photography, publishing and was a result of another one of his publishing workshops. This again sold 2,000 copies and it's now out of print. <laughs> Next. Uh, that's my website, the Goan Architecture Block Spot website, which I was supposed to talk about, but I went off on this tangent. So if you just type Google Goan Architecture and Jose, you get there. Uh, here's a, a, a snapshot of the website. This started with so just me taking photographs of my, uh, my cell phone. I, I've not used an SLR in my life. So I just put up those photographs on a blog and it increased to around 40, 50 blogs. After. Even today, I've not updated for around a year. So there's around 1,000 hits every month. So now I plan to take it into a full-blown mainstream website. So what I meant to say is that you can start with a very simple idea of one page on a blog and it expands into a great, uh, greater thing. Next. Uh, this is a simple calendar that I'm working on right now. We're talking about different kinds of creative products, multi-dimensional. So this is the calendar that I saw. Come back, come back. This is what I saw. And I've developed this into a proper, uh, concrete proverb calendar where you have the concrete meanings and both the scripts and then the English and with the cartoon of Mario Miranda, one for each day of the year. Next. This is a book that I'm working on called Pano Goa. It's panoramic images of uh, Goa, which is just stitched with a easily available software. But that's going to be one of those books. It's got nothing to do with civil engineering. But this is what I mean. Dabble with anything that you want. Be creative, think out that box, and do whatever you want, whatever appeals to you. Next. Uh, this is a concept of a uh, book. This is a design. Uh, this is a one foot by one foot box which I made out of plywood, 30 centimeters, 30 centimeters in all directions, and I use it to store books. So I call it a book cell because you can multiply them as much as you want. Here there's one, two, three stacked on each other. Next. Here you get the slight twist. You can turn them around and take new shapes. Next. You can, here's another arrangement of it. Next. The ever expanding book wall. <laughs> <laughs> Soon starting in Russian Khan's next film. You have seen the film Robot, I presume, where everything just multiplies and other. So, if you have a book set, you have a book wall, if you have a book wall, you have a book house, you have a book town, you have a book city. Never ending. Next. Yeah, so dream mining, multidimensional thinking, interdisciplinary fusion. And that's it. The entropy of the universe is ever increasing. Here's wishing you.